If we may judge from the bust that has come down to us as part of the ruins of ancient sculpture, Socrates was as far from being handsome as even a philosopher can be. A bald head, a great round face, deep-set staring eyes, a broad and flowery nose that gave vivid testimony to many a symposium. It was rather the head of a porter than that of the most famous of philosophers. But if we look again, we see, through the crudity of the stone, something of that human kindliness and unassuming simplicity which made this homely thinker a teacher beloved of the finest youths in Athens. We know so little about him, and yet we know him so much more intimately than the aristocratic Plato or the reserved and scholarly Aristotle. Across two thousand three hundred years we can yet see his ungainly figure, clad always in the same rumpled tunic, walking leisurely through the agora, undisturbed by the bedlam of politics, buttonholing his prey, gathering the young and the learned about him, luring them into some shady nook of the temple porticos, and asking them to define their terms. They were a motley crowd, these youths who flocked about him and helped him to create European philosophy. There were rich young men like Plato and Alcibiades, who relished his satirical analysis of Athenian democracy. There were socialists like Antisthenes, who liked the master's careless poverty and made a religion of it. There was even an anarchist or two among them, like Aristippus, who aspired to a world in which there would be neither masters nor slaves, and all would be as worrylessly free as Socrates. All the problems that agitate human society today and provide the material of youth's endless debate agitated as well that little band of thinkers and talkers who felt, with their teacher, that life without discourse would be unworthy of a man. Every school of social thought had there its representative, and perhaps its origin. How the master lived, hardly anybody knew. He never worked, and he took no thought of the morrow. He ate when his disciples asked him to honor their tables. They must have liked his company, for he gave every indication of physiological prosperity. He was not so welcome at home, for he neglected his wife and children. And from Xanthippe's point of view, he was a good-for-nothing idler who brought to his family more notoriety than bread. Xanthippe liked to talk almost as much as Socrates did, and they seem to have had some dialogues which Plato failed to record. Yet she too loved him, and could not contentedly see him die even after threescore years and ten. Why did his pupils reverence him so? Perhaps because he was a man as well as a philosopher. He had, at great risk, saved the life of Alcibiades in battle, and he could drink like a gentleman, without fear and without excess. But no doubt they liked best in him the modesty of his wisdom. He did not claim to have wisdom, but only to seek it lovingly. He was wisdom's amateur, not its professional. It was said that the oracle at Delphi, with unusual good sense, had pronounced him the wisest of the Greeks, and he had interpreted this as an approval of the agnosticism which was the starting point of his philosophy. One thing only I know, and that is that I know nothing. Philosophy begins when one learns to doubt, particularly to doubt one's cherished beliefs, one's dogmas, and one's axioms. Who knows how these cherished beliefs became certainties with us, and whether some secret wish did not furtively beget them, clothing desire in the dress of thought? There is no real philosophy until the mind turns round and examines itself. Gnothi seautan, said Socrates, know thyself. There had been philosophers before him, of course, strong men like Thales and Heraclitus, subtle men like Parmenides and Zeno of Elia, seers like Pythagoras and Empedocles. But for the most part they had been physical philosophers, they had sought for the physis, or nature of external things, the laws and constituents of the material and measurable world. That is very good, said Socrates, but there is an infinitely worthier subject for philosophers than all these trees and stones, and even all those stars. There is the mind of man. What is man, and what can he become? So he went about prying into the human soul, uncovering assumptions and questioning certainties. If men discoursed too readily of justice, he asked them quietly, Toti, what is it? What do you mean by these abstract words with which you so easily settle the problems of life and death? 
What do you mean by honor, virtue, morality, patriotism? What do you mean by yourself? It was with such moral and psychological questions that Socrates loved to deal. Some who suffered from this Socratic method, this demand for accurate definitions and clear thinking and exact analysis, objected that he asked more than he answered, and left men's minds more confused than before. Nevertheless, he bequeathed to philosophy two very definite answers to two of our most difficult problems. What is the meaning of virtue, and what is the best state? No topics could have been more vital than these to the young Athenians of that generation. The sophists had destroyed the faith these youths had once had in the gods and goddesses of Olympus, and in the moral code that had taken its sanction so largely from the fear men had for these ubiquitous and innumerable deities. Apparently there was no reason now why a man should not do as he pleased, so long as he remained within the law. A disintegrating individualism had weakened the Athenian character, and left the city a prey at last to the sternly nurtured Spartans. And as for the state, what could have been more ridiculous than this mob-led, passion-ridden democracy, this government by a debating society, this precipitate selection and dismissal and execution of generals, this unchoice choice of simple farmers and tradesmen in alphabetical rotation as members of the supreme court of the land? How could a new and natural morality be developed in Athens, and how could the state be saved? It was his reply to these questions that gave Socrates death and immortality. The older citizens would have honored him had he tried to restore the ancient polytheistic faith, if he had led his band of emancipated souls to the temples and the sacred groves, and bade them sacrifice again to the gods of their fathers. But he felt that that was a hopeless and suicidal policy, a progress backward, into and not over the tombs. He had his own religious faith. He believed in one God, and hoped in his modest way that death would not quite destroy him. But he knew that a lasting moral code could not be based upon so uncertain a theology. If one could build a system of morality absolutely independent of religious doctrine, as valid for the atheist as for the pietist, then the theologies might come and go without loosening the moral cement that makes of willful individuals the peaceful citizens of a community. If, for example, good meant intelligent and virtue meant wisdom, if men could be taught to see clearly their real interests, to see afar the distant results of their deeds, to criticize and coordinate their desires out of a self-canceling chaos into a purposive and creative harmony, this perhaps would provide for the educated and sophisticated man the morality which in the unlettered relies on reiterated precepts and external control. Perhaps all sin is error, partial vision, foolishness. The intelligent man may have the same violent and unsocial impulses as the ignorant man, but surely he will control them better and slip less often into imitation of the beast. And in an intelligently administered society, one that returned to the individual and widened powers more than it took from him in restricted liberty, the advantage of every man would lie in social and loyal conduct, and only clear sight would be needed to ensure peace and order and goodwill. But if the government itself is a chaos and an absurdity, if it rules without helping and commands without leading, how can we persuade the individual in such a state to obey the laws and confine his self-seeking within the circle of the total good? No wonder an Alcibiades turns against a state that distrusts ability and reverences number more than knowledge. No wonder there is chaos where there is no thought, and the crowd decides in haste and ignorance to repent at leisure and in desolation. Is it not a base superstition that mere numbers will give wisdom? On the contrary, is it not universally seen that men in crowds are more foolish and more violent and more cruel? Thank you.